<laughs> Ayan, good morning everyone from Batangas. Share the okay, audio. I, yep. Yeah. I think we can start. Uh, yeah. Okay, good morning po sa ating lahat. Welcome po sa lahat ng participants natin dito sa Zoom and sa ating uh, YouTube channel. So our webinar for today is entitled Safety and Risk Management in the Lab. Practicing Safe Science for Good Science. And today po, we are featuring Dr. Anna Karen Lacerna from De La Salle University. So before po tayo mag-start, let's have some house rules. Next slide, please. And so we kindly request po to, uh, to, for our participants to mute and turn their video off during the webinar, unless there's a question. Or pwede rin naman po na mag-comment uh, po tayo sa ating chat box, uh, either sa Zoom or sa YouTube. And maybe also kindly request uh, for everyone to not record the session because the full video of the event will be posted later on. So for the certificate of participation, we will post a Google form link after the session sa ating Zoom chat box, YouTube live comments, and uh, sa ating video description in YouTube pagkatapos po ng session. Uh, record po tayo na mag-subscribe sa ating PhilSci Hub's official YouTube channel and also to follow us on Facebook para po uh, to receive that uh, certificate of participation for this session. So again, welcome po sa lahat to Filipino Science Hub to talk more about our nonprofit organization. May I turn the virtual floor over to JP on. JP? Hello, good morning everyone. Uh, I would just like to reintroduce our group to our uh, new followers. Um, we are uh, the Filipino Science Hub and uh, it's, it is our mission to promote the STEM and uh, to, this, to promote the STEM culture and education uh, and the culture of research among teachers and students in the Philippines. We are a six-man team and uh, we come from different uh, time zones. Uh, right now, po, uh, si Ma'am Dindi is uh, in the U.S. at ako naman po ngayon ay nasa Finland and uh, uh, si Sir Jeff ay nasa Houston kasama ni Ma'am Daang. So, uh, ayun po, uh, we are a six-man team and uh, we have uh, been rolling out um, webinars since last year, and we have been very active um, helping teachers and students, uh, especially in this time of pandemic. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the PhilSci Hub has two major programs right now, the PhilSci Hub Ed and the PhilSci Hub Research University. Uh, in PhilSci Hub Ed, uh, we, uh, support and try to, to empower STEM educators um, so that um, mas structured po yung i-offer nila na uh, mga learning materials sa mga, stud sa mga sudyante. And uh, we uh, based our um, content uh, dun po sa uh, MELCs na in po ng uh, DepEd. So makakasiguro po tayo na yung mga um, uh, mga content namin ay well curated and uh, very well adapted sa, sa mga requirements po ng DepEd. And uh, another uh, thrust is the Phil Sihab Research University where we try to uh, um, the bring STEM practitioners closer to the educational sector. So uh, kami po lahat ay mga uh, practicing scientists and uh, we'd like to reach out to our um, uh, teachers and students in the academe um, para po uh, i-share ang mga expertise namin and uh, uh, maging practical po yung mga tinuturo sa school and uh, they can apply it to real life uh, situations and uh, um, real life research po. 
Uh, at ito pong mga programs namin uh, are geared towards uh, generating a new generation of uh, Philippine of Pinoy STEM enthusiasts. Ayun. Next slide, please. So in Philsci Hub Research University, um, we try to translate learning into practice. So um, yun nga po, uh, what the mind knows, uh, the hands should uh, actually uh, try to make something out of. Ayun po. So yung STEM foundations po and uh, STEM applications converge uh, into uh, this, uh, in this in this program. At tinutulungan po namin yung mga estudyante na mag-carry out po ng mga research project nila and apply whatever basic knowledge that they have. And uh, all, all these is geared towards uh, building that synthetic mindset and, and that learn to create and innovate culture uh, among our students. So sa Philsci Hub Research University po, next slide please. We try to bring out the scientists and everyone uh, by teaching uh, the research fundamentals. And uh, we have done this uh, over the past year where we rolled out um, eight courses uh, that uh, helped our students uh, to carry out their research projects. May, maybe it uh, uh, the uh, science investigatory projects in high school or uh, yung pong mga thesis nila, undergraduate thesis at college. So uh, eight courses po ito, starting with the, the uh, very first uh, course, which is uh, research ideation, where we try to help uh, students and teachers to to come up with uh, research ideas that are uh, feasible and uh, practical. Ayun po. And katatapos lang po nitong uh, campaign namin with the poster and conference presentations. And uh, we have a lot of uh, content, uh, as you can see. So, ayun po. Uh, baka next month po, mag, uh, mag, uh, mag come up po kami ng uh, formal, uh, kasi parang ginawa po namin siyang uh, training course na parang sinalihan and uh, nag-participate po ang 1,300 na students and teachers and uh, yung mga nakatapos po nitong uh, uh, Phil's I Have Research University ay bibigyan po namin ng completion certificate in a formal ceremony uh, scheduled for next month. Ayun po. So, next slide, please. So, uh, the, Phil's, uh, the Filipino Science Hub is ever present in all of its platforms, uh, mainly the the website at triple uh where we have uh, twenty thousand or more visits per month, and uh, we are growing on Facebook and on YouTube, and we're even present on TikTok. So, the website po namin uh, contains all of our webinars, workshops, tutorials, modules, virtual labs, and special features. So, um, kindly check out our website for our full content, and uh, ayun po. Uh, Makita-kita po tayo sa mga susunod po po naming web offering. Ayun. So now, I can hand over the screen to Ma'am Dindi. Yeah, salamat JP. Yep. Um, again, uh, sa mga kaka-join lang, no, we are here uh, for our webinar, Safety and Risk Management in the Lab, Practicing Safe Science for Good Science. So to introduce our speaker for this morning, we will have Professor May John Aguila. So, Ma'am Daang, take it away. Thank you, Dindi. So, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this morning. Uh, Dr. Ana Karen Carrasco Lacerna is the Academic Service Faculty and Equipment Specialist of the Chromatography Laboratory at the Central Instrumentation Facility of De La Salle Uni University. So, prior to working in De La Salle University, she is actually hosted by the same institution as a DOST PCHRD Balik Scientist Awardee. So as a Balik Scientist Awardee, he served as a mentor in their Tuklas Lunas Fellowship Program, lecturer in food analysis, as well as provided assistance in administration, technical and research activities at the said institution. So Dr. Lacerna obtained her BS chemistry degree from the University of the Philippines, Los Banos with a DOST SEI scholarship and graduated magna cum laude in 2005. This is actually uh, where I met Karen. After a few years of working in the quality assurance at Mead Johnson Nutrition Philippines, she pursued her PhD in chemistry degree 
at the prestigious National University of Singapore. Her dissertation was on the metabolic, sorry, metabolomic studies of trauma injuries in collaboration with the Defense Science Organization of Singapore, DSO National Laboratories. After finishing her studies, she continued work as a research assistant and subsequently as a research fellow in the same university, working on projects involving various applications of analytical science, mass spectrometry, and metabolomics in areas such as preclinical or clinical, agricultural, food, forensic science, and environmental research. And aside from her research activities, she has also been actively involved with safety matters throughout her stay at her previous research group's laboratory, taking care of chemical inventory, waste disposal, monitoring of regulated chemicals, and subsequently as internal auditor of the laboratory management system and the group's representative in the safety committee of the NUS Environmental Research Institute. And with that, we are truly grateful that Dr. Lacerna is going to share what she had learned from this a previous post to us as, uh, as we will hear in her talk this morning. So welcome, Karen, to the fields I have. Okay. Maraming salamat, Mom Daang. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning po sa inyo lahat. Magandang umaga sa inyo. Um, okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, yes. Yan. So, okay. So, again, good morning sa lahat. Magandang umaga. Uh, good Saturday morning to all. Um, sa mga taga-ibang bansa, uh, whatever time you are in, good, good, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, so today I will be talking about safety and risk management in the laboratory, practicing safe science for good science. So as um, uh, Ma'am Daang or uh, Professor Aguila has mentioned earlier, um, I'm currently working at the La Salle University, um, uh, previous balik scientist of the OST PCHRD. And prior to that, I worked in, um, I studied and worked in the National University of Singapore. Um, and from there, during that time in Singapore, um, I had been um, exposed um, and learned a lot uh, with regards to safety and risk management. And that is what I would like to share with you all today. Okay, so why do we need to take safety matters seriously? So, of course, we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our colleagues, uh, the people that are working around us. Um, we also need to protect the other workers in our facility and the people beyond the facilities. Um, we also need to protect our loved ones. And uh, later on, we'll, uh, we'll cover some um, safety concerns or accidents that have that have occurred and these can actually have very um, uh, grave consequences um, as you can, as you will see later. And because uh, this happens in our workplace, so we also need to consider protecting our workplace, our work or study and uh, yon, the work that we do. So as you can see, it involves a lot of different aspects of our lives, uh, ourselves, our colleagues, um, the place that we work in, the people that we work with, our loved ones. And so safety is actually a very personal matter. And so that's why we really need to take uh, safety matters seriously. So um, when you least expect it, accidents can happen. So um, you, you will see from different laboratories worldwide, um, not only, hindi, hindi lang siya nangyayari sa mga sabihin natin na okay, mga... Um, universities na hindi kilala, na wala masyadong equipments, wala masyadong resources, but it actually happens also to universities that are quite well known. Uh, UCLA, uh, Yale, Tsinghua, um, maraming iba't ibang accidents that has occurred in the past years related to safety. 
not only in in universities that are not well known or not do not have these resources but even in well known universities these things can happen um and yun it can range from um chemical reactions gone wrong uh, hydrogen gas cylinders exploding um yung simpleng pagtatali ng buhok um once it gets caught once it gets caught in a heavy uh, equipment or heavy machinery so that can also be quite tragic um and as you will see uh minsan in when you're working with biological samples particularly those that are infectious or infectious agents accidents can also happen and so yun pwede mong ma-inject yung sarili mo with um virus or you can uh, accidentally or unintentionally bring the virus out and this can have very grave consequences and so um yun yung gusto kong i-drive na message today that for us to do good science, we have to do it safely. So safe science is good science. Um, yes, we do the work that we do. We do research. Uh, we do experiments for good purposes. So to learn, uh, to help and contribute to the society. Uh, pero if we do not do it safely, it can have very negative consequences. It can uh, have negative impacts then sa society. And so, uh, for us to be able to really contribute and um, have a positive impact, therefore, we need to do safe science. So, please, uh, uh, clarify lang, uh, hindi safe science in the sense na, okay, we stay in a very safe niche. Hindi yon. It's more of how we do uh, these um, experiments and research and studies. Yon. Okay, so... Uh, a bit of an icebreaker. Can I just ask um, our participants to um, just put in the chat box? Uh, I have this illustration of um, what not to do laboratory. So can I just um, ask you guys to um, uh, type in a number of uh, of a lab risk or lab uh, not to do that you see and kung ano yon. So just type in the chat box what is uh yes 15 horse playing number 1 what is number 1 uh, Rodrigo Baño what is number 1 what what is wrong with number 1 Okay so we have a lot of answers yes pipetting with mouth uh octopus wiring covering the first aid chart um Radiation hazard, yes. Merong spill. Disposing chemicals in sink. Climbing the cabinet. And so forth. So, makita nyo, there's a lot of things that are wrong in this picture. So, actually, masyadong pasaway itong, uh, itong ating ano, uh, character dito. Halos lahat na lang ng bawal talaga uh, ginawa na sa lab. And so, actually, um, yes, you, you all have like some idea of what are the things that we are not supposed to do in the lab. And, and as you know, the laboratory can be a very dangerous place if we're not, uh, if we do not know what, what are the things that are present there and what are the things that we should and we should not do. And so it is important to learn more about um, laboratory safety. But uh, I just wanted to share, okay, this is more of my own, um, my own uh, opinion. <laughs> so for me, in terms of like the general laboratory safety rules, uh, meron ako numbers one and two. So first is, first, common sense. Use your common sense. I know, sa, pwede sabihin na, okay, medyo minsan relative yung common sense. What might be common sense to me might be not common sense to another person. And of course, with that, we have to address those things. And uh, later on, we'll cover more on that aspect. Pero, I think all of us has like that instinct of when something is dangerous or when something will be uh, risky for us. And so actually yung ibang aspects, like for example, uh, pa yung pagiging parang si Spider-Man na uh, inaakyat mo yung cabinet, you know the chances of it toppling over, of course, common sense naman yun, di ba? <laughs> can, I get a, can I get a thumbs up if you think that is common sense? What do you think? Common sense naman, no? Oh. So, yung mga ganong bagay, uh, 
yes, it's pretty much common sense. Um, second, yung number two ko, avoid shortcuts. Kasi it's when we try to um, circumvent or when we try to uh, yung padaliin yung bagay or, or the way we do things when we try to avoid uh, following instructions or following the correct protocols, that is when uh, usually things go wrong. So, for example, yung yun nga, um, yung sa pag-akyat nga ng, ng cabinet, so instead of like getting a proper ladder and and uh, using that ladder to climb, uh, uh, to to reach the upper levels of your shelf, uh, yun, akyat din mo yung shelf mismo. And so that is uh, that is a very uh, dangerous um, situation or scenario. And so yun, uh, these are my general laboratory safety rules. First, use your common sense. Uh, you have like some basic idea of what is safe, what is unsafe. And so please make use of that. Uh, and second, yun, let's avoid shortcuts. Uh, let's try to follow um, the protocols uh, that needs to be followed when working in the laboratory. Okay, and then we go to the yung medyo mas specific na, uh, especially if we're not very sure or kapag hindi natin um, established kung ano ba yung baseline uh, when it comes to laboratory safety. So first is know your chemicals. So this one, it's also um, quite basic, especially when you're working in the lab chemical laboratory. So for me, I'm a chemist. I'm an analytical chemist. Um, so I work with a lot of chemicals. Um, since yung lab ko is more of a chromatography laboratory, uh, yung nature of the chemicals that I work with are more of solvents. And so uh, for me, I, I need to know like, what are the properties and the hazards of these chemicals? I also need to know their incompatibilities um, and reactions. I need to know their properties. So, for example, meron kang flammable solvents and oxidizers. Um, definitely, you cannot put them together. So, oxidizers will definitely, um, when, when put together with flammable solvents, can cause uh, fire. And so, that is um, an incompatibility that I need to take off. Uh, take note of. Um, you also have to know the proper handling and storage of your chemicals. So, depending sa chemicals mo, they will have uh, different uh, storage conditions, and we will uh, cover that more in a in a bit. So, we have different chemical hazards. Um, depending sa chemical, um, uh, one chemical can have multiple hazards. Some will have mainly one particular hazard. Uh, and so these are like the different hazardous chemicals classifications based on the globally harmonized system. Um, so you have chemicals that are explosives, including those that are um, self-reactives, self organic peroxides. You have the flammables that are your, of course, flammable gases, aerosols, liquids, and solids, pyrophoric liquids or solids, uh, self-heating substances, self-reactive substances, uh, those that react with uh, water and produces flammable gases such as um, hydrogen gas, um, organic peroxides, and then you also have your oxidizers, which uh, oxidizes gases, liquids, and solids. You have your corrosives such as acids and bases that can cause skin corrosions, burns, eye damage, and uh, can corrode uh, metal. Uh, you have your compressed gases. So this will be your um, those your uh, nitrogen gas or um, oxygen gas that are in compressed um, cylinders. You also have your irritants, um, uh, skin sensitizers, acutoxins, narcotic those that can cause narcotic effects, respiratory tract irritants, hazardous to the ozone layer, and so forth. Uh, you have etong sa bungo is your toxic substances. So those that can cause toxicity when they are um, inhaled, ingested, or absorbed through the skin. You also have those that are of particular hazard to certain organs. So you have those that are reproductive toxins, target um, uh, those that can target your kidney, liver, etc. And you also have um, 
environmental hazard. So, though, uh, I think it's also mostly yung mga corrosives natin and some other compounds that are considered to be environmental pollutants and can can be toxic uh, to um, aquatic uh, organisms. And so, ito yung mga different classifications nga ng chemicals, yung hazards of the ke different chemicals. And th these are very important for us to take note of. And later on, um, we need these um, classifications actually. So, so this is um, where we can get information about the hazards of the chemicals that we are dealing with. So, sinabi ko nga kanina, we need to know the chemicals that we are working with. And so, for us, we can use the safety data sheets as a source of the information that we need uh, to know the, the hazards of our different chemicals. And so, um, actually, yung safety data sheet was previously called MSDS or Material Safety Data Sheet. Now, it's shortened to safety data sheets na lang. Um, the information that you will get, of course, you will have your information with regards to the identifiers of your chemicals. Um, you will have your reach number, CAS number, um, different um, names. So, for example, if you have like chloromethane, if it has like other synon, um, synonym, synonym names or other names, then you will also find it there. Um, Hazard identification and classification. This is, uh, again, very important. This is what we usually need from the safety data sheet. Uh, so here in the hazard identification section of the example here, it will state kung ano ba yung hazards for that particular um, chemical. So, um, for example, skin irritant, eye irritant, carcinogenic, and so forth. And uh, it will also state what is the GHS sticker or GHS classification of that particular um, chemical. So it will also indicate your recommended storage conditions. And so kapag um, it will provide you with information, okay, what is the temperature that it has to be stored in, uh, whether it has, whether it needs um, certain special conditions, whether it has to be kept in nitrogen uh, or, or it has to be refrigerated and so forth. It will also provide exposure controls and personal protection. So it will provide recommendations on what is the glove that you have to use, what are the other um, personal protective equipments that you need that you need uh, when you're using that particular chemical. Um, it will give you physical and chemical properties, stability and reactivity information, toxicological, ecological, regulatory, and transport information. And uh, we have to take note. So here in the upper um, right area of your safety data sheet is the revision date. So uh, usually uh, when you collect safety data sheets for your, um, for your experiments or for your laboratory, uh, you have to constantly review it so, so that um, kasi yung revision date, usually from the revision date, you only keep it until three to four years after the revision date. And after that, you need to like get um, an updated version of your safety data sheet. Uh, bucket. Kasi in some cases, like for uh, particular chemical compounds, um, new toxicological information may be obtained or like um, collected from experiments or from um, knock on wood accidents or um, there are new regulations that have been formulated. And so um, you have to be updated of these things. And so it's important to always, uh, um, it's also important to, to update your collection of safety data sheets for your um, compounds. Uh, okay, so in terms of proper storage, uh, again, you have to take note of the compatibilities of your different chemicals. So you cannot, ex um, here is an example of a, uh, of a storage compatibility chart. So you cannot keep explosives with flammable gases, oxidizing gases, gases under uh, pressure and so forth. Um, you can keep it with water reactives. Uh, to some extent, some, uh, some chemicals might be kept together, but of course, given certain conditions. Um, and so this one is a very useful guide. Um, if you want to like segregate your different compounds. So again, you have to first know 
what is the hazards of your compounds, and then from there, segregate them. So can I just ask, um, for example, acetic acid. So acetic acid is both um, an acid and a flammable. Uh, where will you store uh, acetic acid? Together with the flammables or together with the corrosives, the acids? What do you think um, for acetic acid? Corrosives, okay. Together with corrosives, okay. Okay, so a lot of you answered corrosives. Um, actually, uh, the recommended storage, for example, for acetic acid, for formic acid, which are organic acids, um, is in the flammables cabinet. Uh, why? So actually, kasi organic solvents like um, acetic acid and formic acid, although they are corrosive and they are acidic, um, they can actually react with your inorganic acids such as uh, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, um, hydrochloric acid, they can get oxidized. And so, uh, yun, incompatibility siya. And so usually, organic acids such as formic acid and um, acetic acid are kept in the flammables cabinet, pero they are kept in a smaller, uh, aside from being in the flammables cabinet, they are kept in a smaller containment. So, for example, meron kang small bucket and, um, or, yes, a small bucket that can be uh, fully closed. You'll keep your acetic acid inside that and then keep that bucket containing your acetic or formic acid inside the flammable scarb cabinet. So that is the proper storage for acetic acid. Um, so proper storage will, um, as I've mentioned, will include your flammables cabinet. You will have your um, specific storage um, cabinets also for acids and bases, which are corrosive. So as you can see from here, um, the... The material that is used for flammables is usually uh, metal because um, for, for flammables, for solvents, they might be able to dissolve yung mga polymers natin or plastics. So um, they are usually kept in a metal uh, cabinet. On the other hand, naman, your, acids, your acids and bases, your corrosives are kept in usually in high-density plastic materials or polymer materials because um, you cannot keep them in the corrosives kasi pwedeng makorode ng yun, corrosives yung iyong cabinet. And so, uh, they usually make use of this HDPE or other uh, polymer or plastic materials for the storage of your corrosives. Um, in terms of like uh, using, ah, for, for compounds or chemicals that has to be refrigerated, you have to make use of explosive proof um, refrigerators so you cannot just use your usual household refrigerators so yung mga kelvinator natin ano ba ano, ano ba mga brands na ng ref ngayon so yon yung mga samsung uh, or or uh, kelvinator or condura uh, fridges natin ng na bahay ano frigidaire oh frigidaire <laughs> wala so, na yun ganun na, na Refrigerators are not suitable for chemicals. So yung, uh, you have to get um, refrigerators that are suitable for the lab. So yung mga um, explosion proof uh, or, or yeah, so explosion proof uh, refrigerator. So basically, these are um, refrigerators where in wala, wala kang source of sparks or electronic, um, yun, electronic sparks. Because if you have, um, if you're refrigerating um, organic solvents, there will still be somehow some escapes of um, of vapors that can be flammable, and so you have to make sure that um, your your refrigerators do not have sources of heat or sparks. And so yun yung um, that is the need for the, these explosion-proof uh, refrigerators. And as you can see, if you make use of the usual household refrigerators if anything happens uh, yon medyo malaking damage sa lab kapag sumabog yon okay um, aside from these storage um, considerations you also need to consider that for flammable chemicals 
uh, you have to implement maximum allowable quantities per room and on bench top. So I'm still not very sure about the regulations here in the Philippines, but um, for, in Singapore, uh, they have um, uh, well-defined regulations in terms of like uh, the different chemicals, especially when, uh, for example, uh, for flammables, they have um, a Petroleum and Flammables Act. Uh, and they define there like what are the maximum allowable quantities per given square footage or square meter of uh, floor area. And so you have to follow these, uh, uh, these regulations. Um, and for our case, so aside from having that maximum allowable quantity per room, so pwede ka magkaroon ng mga flammables sa uh, flammables cabinet mo within the room. And aside from that, dun sa bench tops, like for example, in your usual work areas or bench top, you are only allowed a maximum of 20% of the total maximum allowable quantity of the lab uh, to be um, on your bench top. So dapat hindi rin masyadong marami yung um, present no organic solvents or flammables mo in your bench tops. So as much as possible, those that you do not use frequently or yung bulk of your um, solvents has to be in a flammables cabinet. Um, also, uh, you have to provide secondary containment for your different solvent solutions, and it has to hold um, at least 20% of the volume. So in cases of minsan magbasagan ka ng, magbasagan ka ng bote or, or sudden um, spillage, uh, you have to be able to have that containment. Uh, and so usually, meron kami tray that, can, that is about um, a few inches deep uh, to contain our solution bottles, solvent bottles, uh, so that in case anything happens, there is uh, a container uh, to contain whatever spillage that, uh, that, that uh, comes out. So it is also important to properly label your solution. So um, ito, may example ako dito. So 80% uh, methanol is something that I usually use. Um, then I will, of course, indicate my name. So yun, uh, you have to have a complete description and composition of the solution. So 80% um, methanol yun lagay ko dito. So um, implied naman na yun that if you do not indicate what is the other component that is water, so it's 80% methanol, yung 20% is water. Um, username, you have to indicate kung sino yung nag-prepare ng solution and kung sino yung gagamit. Um, hazards, uh, yes, this one is very important, especially if you're not the only one working in the laboratory. It's also for the reference of others who are working in the same laboratory area as you. Uh, so that in case you are not around, if something happens, they are aware of what are the hazards of the chemicals or solutions that you have. Um, you also need to indicate the date of preparation, especially for cases where in you're working with solutions that are not stable through time, uh, those that have oxidizers uh, or you can um, oxidize quickly or in, in terms of like um, some solutions where in evaporations can occur rapidly, nagbabago na yung composition of your, of your um, solution. And so you have to indicate yung date of preparation as well as the date of expiry of until when it can be used. Um, and it is a good practice to include the GHS sticker para at least merong quick reference yung mga tao um, even you, uh, in terms of what are the hazards of that particular solution. So again, of course, yes, you can read it from the label, pero it, this will be a more obvious and an easier uh, reference in terms of like the hazards that are associated with that particular uh, solution or solvent. And uh, please make sure all text content are readable and in language in a language common to all, so please do not use, uh, because previously I was working in uh, Singapore nga, so medyo multi, uh, multi, para kami ASEAN, <laughs> basically. So uh, we have members of different um, countries, and I will usually uh, remind my, my lab mates, our students, that uh, to please uh, put the labels in English. Uh, huwag 
Chinese kasi minsan or or other languages kasi uh, with that we're not sure what are those things because we cannot really read uh, according to their own languages and so this is important so please indicate it in a language that is common to all uh, so yon in english okay so waste disposal so this is another aspect um again as I, as mentioned earlier uh, i have been in charge of waste disposal as well for quite a while um these are some of the things that we uh, that I, that we usually take note of when with regards to waste disposal. Uh, first, of course, is the proper segregation and avoid mixing incompatibles. So again, going back to the incompatibilities, uh, of course, you have your segregation of like, for example, organic solvents. You have chlorinated and non-chlorinated. Um, the waste uh, treatment facilities will have different. Uh, means of treatments for the chlorinated waste versus the non-chlorinated waste. And so please do segregate, segregate them accordingly. Of course, you will have to se segregate your um, waste that are acidic, your basic waste, your acid wastes. Um, you have to segregate them from your um, organic solvent wastes. Um, and please, uh, okay, sorry. Um, avoid using containers for like one chemical as a uh, waste carboy or container for another. Um, there are, has been cases where in, for example, uh, this carboy has been used for acetone and then technical grade acetone. Then naubos na yung technical grade acetone. So okay, natuyo na akala nung researcher, natuyo na fully yung acetone that was in the technical grade carboy in the bottle. And then subsequently, naglagay siya ng nitric acid in that same bottle. So nitric acid waste. Uh, and yun, it turns out there were still some residual acetone that was present. It caused explosion of that particular container. And so yun, it's very important uh, not to use uh, yung mga um, carboys or containers for uh, other solvents to contain the wastes. Um, uh, for different types of solvents. So again, going back to compatibilities. Uh, and also, in if you're storing your secondary, ah, if you're storing your wastes um, before collection, uh, they also need to be in secondary containment that can hold approximately 20% of the total volume. And again, this is coming from in the scenario where in kapag nagkaroon na spillage, you would have like some um, container to uh, hold some of that uh, spillage until you will be able to uh, have a replacement uh, or be able to properly dispose uh, the, the waste. And so this is also important to have that secondary containment. And it's it's easier to clean up. Diba kapag, kapag kumalat na siya sa almost uh, a, a big area of your room and then mas mahirap na siyang linisin so if it's contained in like one area then it's easier to uh, deal with um, also do not fill uh, your containers to the brim uh, wag tayo magtipid ng containers uh, fill it only up to 75% especially when dealing with um, organic solvents and fuming acids um, you have to have enough space for or head space for the fumes or like the vapors that are coming from this waste. Otherwise, pwede nga uh, mag-explode yung container, uh, ma-overpressurize and mag-explode yung container. And so, uh, please uh, do not fill to the brim only up to 75%. So, this is our usual practice. Um, also, please do not dispose in the sink. Uh, later on, you wouldn't want to be drinking <laughs> or uh, using the 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 chemicals or the waste that you that you um, dispose in the sink as well. So this is a very important um, matter. Uh, we take care of um, everyone in the lab as well as our environment. And so uh, please do not dispose your waste in the sink. Of course, there are some that can be, um, for example, yung mga sodium chloride solutions without containing anything else. Yung mga relatively safe naman na mga uh, solutions like that. Uh, pwede. Uh, pero again, as much as possible, uh, uh, no. <laughs> Let's dispose our solutions properly. Uh, this is 
a no-no. Um, and you have to make use of licensed third-party waste collectors. So, um, yon, aside from not disposing in the sink, uh, when disposing, make sure that you are doing the disposal with licensed third-party waste collectors, which has the right facilities to handle and dispose your waste. So, hindi basta-basta, hindi pwedeng yung uh, kung sino lang na um, waste collectors yung uh, kukontratahin natin. They have to be licensed. They have to have the right facilities. Okay. So, aside from knowing your chemicals, you have to also know the equipments and the experiment setups uh, that you are going to work with. And again, this goes to um, this will include aspects of knowing what are the hazards of the equipments and your experiment setups, what is the needed training before the use, to have that proper training before the use, um, the availability of uh, work instructions and SOPs. There should be uh, work instructions and SOPs that are available to the users for them to refer to, um, and also to have to prepare and to read and understand risk assessment. So uh, you have to know the hazards of like the equipments that you are working with. You have to um, evaluate as well as understand what are the risks of these equipments and how can you control these risks. And we will discuss that in a bit, uh, in more details in a bit. So in case of emergency, it's so important to take note of um, you need to have your spill kits. So depending on what was spilled, uh, there will be different um, di there will be different spill kits for that. You have different spill kits for um, organic solvents versus those that are mainly for acids and bases. For acids and bases, you need to like neutralize first before you uh, dispose of um, these spills. And so they will have different uh, requirements. Uh, you also have different requirements if you're dealing with chemical versus biological spills. So biological spills, aside from like your um, um, uh, absorbent pads and all, you have to have um, the disinfectant. So usually you have to mix a certain amount of like um, chlorine. Uh, you have to prepare, at, I think, about 10,000 ppm bleach uh, for disinfection. And also... Um, in some cases, you, you can make use of like some but, uh, tablet. So meron na kasing in tablet form na ilalagay mo lang sa one bucket of water and then that will be used for the disinfection of your uh, spill. So there are um, available kits for that. And you have to regularly check the contents of your spill kit. So in cases wherein um, nagamit yung mga spill kits, of course, some of these uh, things will run out like yung mga pillows, yung mga um, absorbent pads, uh, yung gloves, etc. So some of these might have to be disposed because they are contaminated. And so you need to regularly check your spill kits to make sure that you have enough of the supplies that are needed in case of emergency. Um, in terms of, uh, yon, in case of accident also, uh, you need to have your emergency shower and eye wash. So this is an example of your eye, uh, emergency shower and this is your eye wash. So ito is more of a joint uh, setup wherein meron kang eye wash station at saka yung emergency shower mo. So they have to be unobstructed. So ang hirap naman na kumbaga na aksidente ka na nga sa lab and then madadapa ka pa or matatalisod ka pa, pa on your way to the emergency shower or, or eye wash. So uh, parang double job party Job, double jeopardy na siya, di ba? So, you have to have um, unobstructed access to this uh, emergency shower and eye wash so that uh, in case of any emergency, um, yun, mawawash ka agad uh, either yung buong katawan mo or your eyes um, kapag nagkaroon ng aksidente. And also, you have to regularly check them as well. So, uh, yun, mahirap din na... Um, Magkaroon na aksidente, yung pala hindi na gumagana yung emergency shower or yung emergency eye, uh, yung, sorry, yung eye wash nyo. So that can also be a problem. So you have to make sure that they are working well. And of course, kasi yung, yung um, eye wash is going straight to your eyes and pre pressured yung water dyan, syempre. And so you have to make sure na laging malinis yung, um, yung, yung outlet nung... Um, 
eye wash station mo. So, walang mga ali-ali kabok or walang mga um, foreign matter that is uh, stuck on the outlet of your eye wash. So, importante yun. Otherwise, bubulagin mo pa yung gagamit ng eye wash if, if, if they make use of it. Um, and yun, uh, this is one way of like doing your regular checks. You have to make sure that there is water um, coming out, of course. Uh, so, this is like one way you have like some containment to contain the uh, water. So, you really have to um, let it flow, let it work, and uh, make sure that it has uh, the water supply. Um, also, spill kits. Uh, this is also very important. It has to be easily accessible and unobstructed. Um, you have to regularly check them. So at least monthly. Um, and make sure that expired items are replaced and items that has been used uh, can be replenished. Kasi yun, you don't know at any given point if there is an accident which one of these uh, first aid kit items you will be using. And so you have to make sure that you have enough of the supplies. Um, in terms of like certain experiments or certain chemicals, there are certain hazards na merong special requirements. So for example, if you're, make, if you're working with um, hydrofluoric acid, um, you have to have a stock of the calcium gluconate uh, cream. So that one is meant to complex uh, the HF uh, kasi yung HF can easily get absorbed in your, in your skin once it reaches your, uh, I think it can actually uh, corrode your bone so um, and it can really spread uh, in the body. And so it's really important that you are able to complex it or contain it immediately. And so uh, they make use of this calcium gluconate cream to do that. And so if you're working with HF, of course, you have to have the proper training when, when working with HF and also to have this particular um, uh, cream in your first aid kit. Okay, so far, kamusta? <laughs> Any questions so far? Wala pa naman. O, sige. Uh, tuloy ko lang. Okay, so, um, so what I'm giving now is more of as you can see, it's more of a general laboratory safety. It's more of like um, what are the, uh, the usual things that you have to take note of when working in the laboratory. Um, every now and then, I will jump into chemical safety or biological safety. So these are the things that I mainly worked with when I was in Singapore and um, most likely uh, in my work currently. And so, yun, uh, it's more of like general reminders, practical things that you have to take note of when working in the lab. Okay, so, uh, ito, fire extinguishers. You have your different fire extinguisher types depending on the um, substance that you have to extinguish. You have your those that are for um, car, paper, wood, coal, cardboard, and so forth. You have... Um, those that are for flammable liquids and solid fuel fires, etc. So it depends on uh, the type of material. So you have class A, class B, class C, class D, E, and F. So class A is again combustible materials, B is flammable liquids, C is flammable gases, D is flammable metals, E uh, electrical, you have uh, for electrical fires, and you also have for um, cooking oils. So um, these are the different types. Uh, you have the blue uh, extinguisher, uh, powder extinguisher that can be applied for the different um, classes of materials except for cooking oil. So this is actually a very um, common fire extinguisher uh, that is found in the lab kasi a general siya. So magagamit mo siya for different types of fire except for cooking oils, which is uh, hindi naman masyadong common sa lab. So yun. Um, okay, so important things to take note of when working uh, in case of fire uh, and when you're uh, making use of the fire extinguishers. Um, okay, first, yung mga kailangan gawin uh, in terms of like the general, um, uh, general things to take note of. One, it has to be in an obstructed location. Um, you have to regularly check it as well. So um, 
from earlier, di ba, meron na tayong mga iba't ibang kailangang irregularly check. So you have your spill kits, your emergency shower, your eye wash station, your first aid kit, and you have to add this as well. So you have to regularly check your um, fire extinguisher, make sure that the pin is intact, the seal is not broken. Um, yung pressure gauge niya is on the operable side. So meron siyang um, indicator that dapat nandun siya sa green side. And also, uh, you have to check the service date. So supposedly, these fire, extinguisher, fire extinguishers can last up to six years, but they have to be checked uh, yearly. So uh, there should be a professional um, third party uh, in charge of the uh, fire extinguishers they that, that will be checking it yearly. Um, and in terms of like using, in case na kailangan yung gamitin, um, you have to take note of this um, acronym PASS. So first, pull the pin. So there's a pin in the fire extinguisher that you have to pull for it to uh, be used. And then A is aim at the base of the fire. So hindi ka mag-aim dun sa, sa flames mismo. You have to aim at the base of the fire. Uh, S is squeeze the, the trigger. So it's uh, the delivery of the material uh, at the fire. And S is sweep sideways. So until you extinguish the fire. So, um, in case of fire, you have to assess if it can be safely extinguished. So, depending, of course, sa laki nung sunog nung fire, as well as your own capability, whether you'll be able to uh, properly and safely make use of the fire extinguisher to uh, extinguish the fire, uh, you have to assess that. Kung hindi ka talaga masyadong familiar and you're not comfortable and uh, you're not that confident uh, to make use of the fire extinguisher, then better move to the next step, which is activate the fire alarm, call the fire department and campus security and alert everyone who is in the same area to evacuate. So, yun. so these are the things that you have to take note of in case of fire. And of course, assemble dun sa assembly area nyo. So you have to take note of where are the fire exits of your lab and uh, assemble dun sa assembly area. So again, um, so we have covered no die chemicals, no die equipment and experiment setups. Lastly, you have to know die lab. So um, you have to know what is the location of your fire extinguishers, location of your spill kits, the emergency shower and eye wash stations, the hazards present. So um, especially if you're working in a lab na masyadong diverse yung, yung mga projects of the different people working there, then you have to have some idea, maybe not, not everything, but you have to have some idea of what they are doing and what are the hazards that are associated with the work that they do. Uh, para in case na may mangyari, um, not only can you, um, uh, you'll be able to assist them, uh, help them to, to um, for example, um, uh, wash themselves or, or you'll be able to help um, address the fire or uh, do something else to, to, to address the accident or emergency. Uh, so yun, you should be able to be, you should be aware of the hazards present um, for those purposes as well as for protecting yourself as well. So for example, um, you know na merong gumagamit na mga volatile uh, toxic materials in the same lab, then you have to also make use of the same uh, of the uh, of the proper PPE. If there is a need for rep respirators, please do make use of respirators. Uh, if you're working in the same area and hindi makokontain yung uh, mga vapors na yun. Um, and this is also to, um, I think we have to develop yung culture of safety awareness and um, safekeeping of each other. So aside from like just taking care of your own self, uh, you have to also take note of um, the safety of the others who are working with you. So you're not on, you are your brother's keepers, you are your colleagues' keepers. And so you have to uh, also make sure that they are in a safe environment as they work with you. Um, storage, location of different chemicals. Again, yes, this is important. You have to store um, different chemicals according to the proper storage for them. Um, emergency exits and assembly area in case of emergencies and accidents. Uh, you have to make sure that 
you are aware of where to go in case of emergency, where is the fire exit, uh, you are aware of where are the fire alarms, um, and uh, if needed, yun nga yung fire extinguisher. And also, um, for some building, they will have a call point. So if you, if you um, press that call point, not only will it trigger the alarm, but it will also have um, a means to contact um, either campus security or directly to the um, fire department. Um, and please take note, fire, fire exceeds has to be kept unobstructed din pala. So yon. in addition, you have to also make sure that your fire exceeds are unobstructed. Okay, so this is just an example of a layout um, showing, okay, nasaan yung fire extinguisher, um, where are your fire exceeds, uh, and so forth. So yun. Now, okay, before we go into the risk assessment, can I just check if there's any questions? Okay, so far wala pa. Okay pa naman? Maraming questions, uh, Karen, actually, pero uh, we will... Um... Acknowledge them later ah, after okay, your sige. presentation. Ayan. Okay. And dami ng and dami ng questions sa YouTube actually. Ah, sige. Yeah. Okay. Ayan. Ayan. Um. So okay, we go now to uh, risk management and risk assessment. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, when we're working with certain experiment setups, when we're working with certain equipments, we have to make sure that we are aware of what are the hazards of these equipments and what are um, the control measures that we can employ uh, to make sure that we make use of them or we implement these experiments set up safely. And so, dito na papasok yung risk management and risk assessment. So, uh, first, what is risk management? When we talk about risk management, it is a systematic approach to identifying or assessing the risks that are associated with any work activity. So that is what we call risk assessment. Uh, we communicate this risk to all persons involved and we control and monitor such risks. And so um, actually a very big part or integral part of this risk management is yung tinatawag natin na risk assessment. So why do we need to Oh, sorry. This is first, um, ito muna, yung risk management process flow chart. So first, you have to prepare, um, form a team to perform the risk assessment and gather the relevant information. So ito yung mga kailangan mo na preparations before you work on the risk assessment. Uh, you have to assemble a team. Uh, they have to be knowledgeable of what is um, the experiment to be performed or what is the equipment that has to be worked on or operated uh, so that they can advise kung ano ba yung mga hazards um, that are present when working in, with these experiments or with these equipments. And uh, usually, um, part, uh, members nito will be, of course, your uh, researchers or students that will be working um, with that particular setup or equipment, the principal investigator or the PI who supposedly will have um, more experience um, with these particular setups as well as, uh, for example, merong research fellow or postdoc who can also help guide. Uh, so these are the um, main members of your uh, risk assessment team. Uh, if you have um, service engineers or uh, equipment specialists who can also assist uh, in preparing this, then that would also be very useful. Um, if you have safety health officers in your building who can also help, then please do include them in the formation of this RA team. Um, of course, you have to gather relevant information. We will cover this a bit more later. Uh, second is hazard identification to identify the hazards as well as the potential accidents and incidents that may result from these hazards. Um, third is risk evaluation. So you estimate the risk levels and prioritize the hazards that has to be controlled. Uh, fourth is risk control. So the risk control will include uh, the formulation of the control measures that has to be implemented. This will be according to the hierarchy of controls, which we will cover later on. And then um, analyze and evaluate the residual risk. So um, acceptable ba or hindi yung residual risk after employing certain risk controls. 
Number five, record keeping. So it is important to keep a record of your risk assessment for three years. Pero um, please take note that you don't just keep it in record na, okay, nagawa mo, and then itatago mo na, then that's it. So it's not just a paper exercise. You have to make sure that you implement it. You have to make sure that all um, subsequent users or students or researchers that will be working on these experiments or uh, equipments will have uh, read and understood this risk assessment. So they will be able to be uh, more competent and confident in performing um, the experiments or using the equipments uh, safely. Um, and yun, uh, doon papasok yung implementation nga. Um, the review will be every three years. Um, it can be reviewed again after, um, as needed, if there is in new information given, kapag merong nagbago sa work process mo, and in the unfortunate uh, uh, case wherein magkaroon ng accident or incident, that means hindi nag-work yung uh, risk assessment and the controls. And so you will have to reevaluate your uh, risk assessment. So these are the different steps of the risk management process. Um, the risk assessment will be covering this part wherein you identify the hazard, evaluate the risk, and establish your risk control. And so uh, yun, these different parts consist of the overall process flowchart for the risk management. Now, um, again, at different parts of this um, flow chart, actually, uh, different parts of the process, you need to have constant communication, not only among the members of the risk assessment team, but as well as with other stakeholders. So other members of the research lab or other users of the facility, in case meron din silang mga feedback or information that they can share with regards to the particular ex, uh, experiment or equipment. And subsequently, once you have the risk assessment, you also have to make sure that you communicate it properly to all who are involved, to all, all who are who will be using uh, that particular equipment set up, as well as to the management of that uh, lab. Uh, because they also need to keep a record of this. They also need to make, uh, make sure that um, the things that you are do have the proper risk controls and that we're doing properly. So uh, this uh, communication is a very important part uh, in this risk management uh, flow chart as well. Okay, so yes, we will be addressing the questions uh, later. So actually, um, I'm again using as a reference to these, um, my experiences, um, the materials that I have also learned from uh, my experience and uh, the trainings that I attended from uh, the National University of Singapore. So again, much thanks and acknowledgement goes to them. Uh, so for giving me this, uh, these learnings that I'm sharing with you as well. So yun, yung Occupational Safety, Health and Environment uh, Office of the National University of Singapore is responsible for um, yeah, taking care of, of the overall safety and health uh, of NUS. And actually, kasi di ba, parang kapag um, yung mga safety health officers natin, minsan parang hindi natin na-appreciate. Um, we, we consider them as parang mga villains. <laughs> In terms of like, okay, eto na naman to. Uh, kumbaga na, they, they sometimes can hinder uh, intentionally the things that we do in the lab, not because they wanted to, but because they have to ensure that we do it safely. So it's, it's, it's that. We have to recognize that that is their purpose. And so we have to work with them uh, so that we'll be able to find a compromise so that we can do our research without also endangering ourselves. So yun naman yung gusto nila, uh, that we work together, that we, um, that we do our things safely. So we work with our uh, safety health officers. Okay, so yun, uh, why do risk assessment? Uh, protect ourselves from injuries, prevent accidents and incidents, assess if a work, pre, uh, work process is safe to proceed, assess the adequacy of the existing control measures and compliance with legal, legal requirements. So I'm not sure, um, can, can some of the audience uh, give some feedback regarding what is the requirements for uh, is it required for laboratories to provide risk assessments here? Safety risk assessments? 
perhaps in the industries. Tama ba? Oh, usually kasama 'yan sa mga ano, 'di ba? Um management systems. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-mm. So, sa industries wala masyadong problema. That is usually mm-hmm. part of the environmental health and safety uh, requirements of the yeah. industries. Pero sa um, academ sa academ hindi pa masyado. I would say. So, yeah. Yes, yes. So, and that is why I wanted to like share this kasi Um, I think we really, really need to practice this in the academe. We need to ensure that we know um, how to do things properly and safely. And so we have to make sure that we do our risk assessments before our experiments, before our projects. Okay. So, um, yun. Uh, let's just go through like some uh, procedures or steps on how to go about this risk management and assessment. We have covered them a bit kanina, and I'll try to uh, give a bit more details to the different steps in this part. So again, before starting an experiment, work process, or operation, dapat meron kang risk assessment. So you can have an experiment-based risk assessment. You can have a protocol-based risk assessment. You can also have... Um, a risk assessment that is, that is specific for a particular project. So for example, if I have a project looking at the um, extract, at, uh, sorry, looking at um, extraction of different natural products, uh, then I would have, I could have a, um, a separate risk assessment for that. Or you can also make it based on the procedure. So for example, in terms of like the initial extraction protocol, You can have your own separate um, risk assessment as well for it. Um, uh, equipment, dependency equipment. So for example, we have an NMR. Uh, so NMR, that is uh, highly magnetic. And so you have to take note of like what not to bring inside um, uh, in the vicinity, in the, in the near vicinity of the NMR. Uh, you have to take note of like, uh, you have to make use of stainless steel Um, cylinders, gas cylinders, uh, hindi pwede yung mga um, ferromagnetic na materials inside. Otherwise, they will be flying into uh, your NMR and things like that. You have to make sure that you properly assess the risks, uh, properly identify the hazards, and establish the correct um, control measures. Okay, so yun. Uh, steps first, form a team to do the assessment gather the information and breakdown of the activity to steps. So again, um, important to this is the breakdown of activity to steps. So dapat, as in talagang step by step. So if you are looking at a particular protocol, kailangan yung gagawin mong um, risk assessment, uh, hihimayin mo yung different steps of your protocol. So hindi pwede na, okay, one bulk, steps one, two, three, ito yung risk assessment niya. Hindi pwede. So dapat, it has to be step by step. Um, information needed, of course, uh, yung laboratory layout plan nyo, uh, what are the different engineering controls that are uh, available as well, uh, yung process flow chart, um, list of work activities, so yun nga, step by step siya dapat. Yung balat, mm, sorry? yung leather, yung leather. Ay, <laughs> si Jeff. <laughs> okay. I'm so, sorry about that. <laughs> So, yung list of chemicals, equipment, and machinery that is used. So, you have to have that information. Um, safety data sheets and operation manuals. There are important resources or information sources. So, yung nga, safety, data, safety data sheets will provide you the hazards of the different chemicals and as well as the proper handling and storage conditions. Your operations manuals will provide you with some information regarding the safety hazards of your equipment. So, yun, they're very useful. Um, records of past incidents and accidents, whether it be in the same laboratory or in similar settings or in, yeah, in other laboratories. Um, also, relevant legislation, codes of practice or specification. So, yes, uh, depende. Uh, so, um, there, there will be regulations with regards to flammables, Uh, explosives, explosive precursors, uh, etc. Uh, so, going back to this, uh, the third step will be to identify the hazards. So, anything that can cause bodily injuries is, is identified as a hazard. 
um, you have different types of hazards. You can have biological hazards. So those that are uh, involving biological safety. So um, possible exposures to um, infectious agents or zoonotic, um, zoonotic infections. So you have to take note of that. Um, physical hazards will be um, anything related to uh, yun, uh, mechanical injuries. Um, ah, sorry, yun, meron pa palang mechanical injuries. So physical and mechanical injuries uh, causing na uh, hazard. So there you have you also have to identify them. Um, electrical hazards, uh, those that can cause electric shock, like electrocution, ergonomic hazards like these. Like uh, if you're going to um, lift heavy objects, you need to be able. You need to know how to um, lift them properly. So these are the things that you have to no take note of in terms of the different hazards. And so. Yun nga, depende sa chemicals naman, you have different uh, hazards pa. So you have those that are radioactive, meron ka pang irritants, meron kang, ah, sorry, this is biological safety, this is your radioactive materials, your irritants, your shock explosives, your flammables, etc. Um, so hazard identification has to be per chemical. And uh, if um, you have... So there are, again, chemicals that can have multiple hazards. So you need to do risk assessment per hazard per chemical. So for one chemical, you have to have multiple um, assessment, depending on hazards. Mo. Um, also, you have to identify the persons as, at risk. Um, we define risk as the likelihood that a hazard can cause a specific bodily injury. Um, you have to identify the risk, the existing risk controls, kung ano na yung mga, uh, available na risk controls, uh, given your current laboratory conditions. Um, and this is your hierarchy of risk controls. So um, most effective will be elimination. So when we say elimination, uh, you identify a particular hazard, you, need, you eliminate the cause of that hazard. So, for example, if you're dealing with very um, toxic or very reactive chemicals, if there is a way for you uh, to eliminate or remove that part of the process, then that will be good. That will be actually the most effective uh, means of risk control. Uh, if not, if you can instead find a replacement for that uh, chemical, uh, then that is identified as substitution. So, for example, um, in reductive amination. So in reductive amination, you make use of sodium cyanoborohydride. Uh, so this is actually a very flammable and toxic chemical. Um, you, can, you can replace it with something that is less toxic um, and less reactive, which is, uh, for example, picolin borin. So that will be a replacement, a less hazardous replacement for your sodium cyanoborohydride. Um, for engineering controls, dito papasok yung mga um, equipments that are available in the lab, such as your, um, of course, in biological safety, um, considering biological safety, if you're working with uh, microorganisms and different um, biological agents, uh, you have different um, uh, levels, biosafety levels, and different requirements for the different bios biosafety levels. So, BSL-2, uh, may basic requirement ka for biosafety cabinet as well as negative pressure ventilation. Um, BSL-3, you have additional requirements further. If you have to go BSL-4, uh, then mas, mas rigid or mas strict yung mga requirements for BSL-4. And this is depending on uh, the risk level of, your, of the agents that you are dealing with. So meron tayo na less, uh, hindi masyadong um, hazardous those that can be done on benchtop as long as you as long as you practice uh, proper or good microbiological practices then that is considered like BSL1 then of course you have those that um, uh, that are of uh, relatively higher risk then you have BSL2 and uh, BSL3 and BS, BSL4 are for those that are more of the infectious kinds uh, and especially in BSL4 is if is, uh, those that are really deadly and um, and uh, there is no known or like uh, there's no uh, immediate or established cure or treatment for that for that particular infection. So yon, mer meron tayong mga different uh, BSL levels. Now, 
uh, engineering controls again will include your um, um, laboratory um, equipments, biological safety cabinets, fume hood, um, the negative pressure uh, conditions, etc. So this isolates the people from the hazard. Um, yung administrative control naman, they change the way the people work. So um, this will include your SOPs, work instructions, provision of the proper training, establishment of the protocols, uh, etc. Um, and yun, papasok din dito yung risk assessment mo. So to conduct proper risk assessment, establish um, and provide, identify the risk controls. Um, lastly, yung pinaka-last um, level of defense or risk control will be your PPE. So um, actually, minsan parang kinoconsider siya na balikta, di ba? Parang uh, first line of defense ko is uh, PPE. Pero actually, uh, it has to be, it's actually the least effective. And so parang last resort mo na siya. Although, of course, you, this is the one that you, that you, that is more, more, uh, mas nakikita, siya yung mas obvious, but actually, it is at the last level of defense na. So, this is meant to protect the worker, uh, given na hindi natin, kumbaga, hindi lahat na control can be provided by the other risk controls, then dito tayo papasok. So, in terms of personal protective equipment, uh, okay. So, you have your usual um, safety goggles or glasses, lab coat, um, gloves, long pants, closed toe shoes. So, these are basics when you're working with a chemical laboratory. Uh, you have to make sure that you have these personal protective equipments. Um, hindi pwedeng nakachinelas uh, or nakashorts uh, and naka-unbutton naka yung lab coat mo. So, you have to... Wear them properly, actually. And hindi pwede na yung safety goggles or glasses is nasa taas ng ulo. So you have to uh, make use of them properly for them to be able to protect you. Um, glove selection is very important. So there is this one case of um, a professor uh, dying because of dimethyl mercury poisoning kasi uh, because of a few drops lang. So... Uh, I think 400 milligram, a few drops equivalent of uh, dimethyl mercury. Uh, she was wearing latex gloves and these actually um, penetrated the gloves and reached her skin. And so it was absorbed in her body and this caused the poisoning and this uh, results uh, in her um, tragic death. And so this is to highlight the importance of selecting the correct gloves. Uh, for the chemicals that you are working with. So you have these different chemical resistant charts available from the different suppliers of your gloves. Please do take note of which glove is suitable for the chemical that you're working with. So for example, for dimethyl formamide, um, a good, good gloves to use for this will be your neoprene as well as uh, latex gloves. Um, yung hindi suitable yung nitrile as well as the PVC gloves. And so yun, uh, you can refer to these uh, references. And you can you have to make use of the appropriate gloves again and refer to SDS. So ito, yung SDS nyo can be a good source as well of the information as, with, as to which gloves to use. Um, eye protection are of different types, safety glasses when working with small amounts, Safety goggles for those that has dangers of splashes and for places where of dense particulate environment. Um, face shields is uh, used if there is even greater chances of splashes or flying objects, um, especially if you're working with cryogenics. Um, you usually make use of, um, of a face shield on top of the uh, safety goggles or safety glass. So in the... Hindi face shield lang, ah. so you have to wear either safety glass or safety goggles and then the face shield. Um, okay, so yun, after you have identified the persons at risk and identified the risk controls, um, you need to assess the risk using the risk matrix. And so this is, um, again, your risk is the likelihood that a hazard can cause a specific bodily injury. Um, these can be uh, determined by looking at the severity and likelihood. So when we talk about severity, um, is the, it is the amount of damage or harm that a hazard could create. So depende, uh, ano ba yung pwede maging consequence ng hazard? 
Uh, so that will be your severity. Likelihood will be the probability of the hazard occurring. So that is uh, likelihood. So um, this is the risk matrix that is usually used. So again, this is the one that uh, we previously used in NUS. So um, you have this matrix of consequence versus likelihood. Uh, if you have um, you have a grading system, actually, so if it's not likely to occur, then the score is one. If it's possible, two. Likely, three. And then if the consequence is minor, then it is uh, the score for consequence is low, one. Kapag uh, it's it's possible to have lacerations, burns, and other work-related injuries that are requiring medical treatments, that is considered two. If it's something that can be fatal, uh, life-threatening or can cause permanent disability, then that is uh, considered uh, risk, uh, sorry, consequence uh, score three. And from there, you will be able to make use of this matrix. So kapag low, yung consequence and likely, I'm sorry, I think. Ah, yes, yeah. So if your consequence is um, uh it seems the um, yeah okay so if it's low consequence and uh, likely actually this one is this sorry yeah. <laughs> sorry for so unlikely pero a uh, low consequence it will be uh, considered a uh, one and kapag uh, if it's possible and uh, medium consequence uh, four, if it's um, likely likely to happen and high consequence it's nine. So actually, ano siya? So one, two, three, yung scoring, and then for to, for you to get the risk, it you just need to multiply. So unlikely, tapos low consequence that is one times one, so equals to one. So if it's for example likely three. Tapos, low consequence, that is 1 times 3. So, therefore, the risk level is 3. Uh, if it's um, if it's likely but medium consequence, so that is 2 multiplied by 3. So, that is 6. So, yun. And from there, you can determine what is the um, uh, risk level and what is the decision process. So, kapag yung less than 3, yung, yung score mo for the risk, then it is considered acceptable risk. Um, kapag 3 yung score, it's considered that you have to add additional risk control. So it is suggested to add additional risk control. Kapag greater than 3 yung score, then additional risk control is actually required. So yon. So again, risk is equals to your likelihood multiplied by the severity. So again, this will be depending on the score that you get for uh, the likelihood versus the consequence. Okay. So after that, after identifying the risk level, if needed, you might have to identify additional controls. So again, this is if um, the risk score is either three or four, or four and up. So kapag um, three yung score, then it, has, it can be considered. So um, you can consider adding additional risk controls. Kapag higher than that, then you have to, or it is required that you add in additional risk controls. Um, again, number eight is to implement. So it is important to make sure that we implement yung risk assessment. So hindi lang siya paper exercise uh, para maging useful siya, para ma-ensure ma natin yung safety of everyone who is involved in the experiment or in the equipment. And uh, yun, lastly, again, review and modify the risk assessment um, at regular intervals, for example, every three years. Or if there is a change in process, kung nagkaroon ka ng change in equipment or nag-scale up ka, then you have to assess whether the risk control still holds uh, or if needed, you have to employ additional risk controls. Uh, also, if there is an accident, then that means your, your risk controls is not sufficient and therefore you have to review again the risk assessment and employ additional controls. Okay, so again, this is your uh, risk management process flowchart, uh, the different parts, and again, highlighting the importance of communication across the different steps of the risk management process. Um, I will just briefly show you an example of, um, of a risk assessment. 
So this is um, an example of an experiment-based risk assessment for a particular part of that of, of my experiment. So, um, for example, if I'm doing acid hydrolysis of dextran leather, again I have to specify the different steps. So, kailangan talaga um, step by step siya. So, yung mula pagwawain nyo hanggang sa paglalagay nyo ng acid and so forth, kailangan step by step. And then, you identify the hazards. So, for example, the dextran ladder is considered not hazardous. And so, wala siyang actually masyadong hazard except for like possible irritation coming from particulate matter. So, that will be your uh, possible accident. And then, the risk control will be mainly to wear your PPEs. Uh, and yun. So, yung risk level is low. So, severity is one, likelihood is one. So actually, you can again do this in Excel sheet, and then you can, um, yeah, you can just uh, put in the formula. So risk level is equals to severity multiplied by your likelihood. And then, um, yun, if you have um, hazardous chemicals like these, um, HCL, you identify what is the um, hazard of that particular chemical. If you're working with solutions having multiple chemicals, then you have to. Um, enumerate yung iba't ibang chemicals dito. So one step can have multiple hazards, uh, multiple chemicals. Uh, and then from there, you also have to consider ano-ano ba yung hazards for that particular chemical. So if, for example, if you have methanol, it is both flammable and toxic. So the, therefore, for that particular chemical, you, you will have to have two different risk assessments depending on the hazard. Um, also, for this one, so as you can see from here, incubation of the mixture at 90 degrees for two, two hours. So you have to consider um, the hazard of working at high temperature, electrical hazard coming from the use of electrical equipment, um, chemical exposures, glass breakage. And this, again, has to be um, evaluated separately. So what will be the possible accidents? What are the risk controls that you can implement? Um, and uh, yun, so paggamit ng PPEs, working under the fume hood, uh, putting in place certain signages for those that are, for the others who are working in the lab, uh, etc. And so again, assess based on the severity and likelihood. Um, so this will indicate who has performed the, uh, the risk assessment and subsequently it will be approved by your PI. Um, and this again will have to be um, revisited every three years. Um, you can also, for example, for, for um, steps wherein meron ka ng ibang risk assessment for that. For example, for the use of a freeze dryer, you have a separate um, risk assessment for that. And then, so for that part, you just need to refer them to the RA for the freeze dryer. Okay. And so let me just uh, go back again to the slides. So, ayun, as I mentioned, it has to be a step-by-step -step assessment. You have to specify the amount. So, um, the risk assessment has to be based on the amounts that you are going to deal with for that particular experiment. Kapag nag-scale up ka, then you have to revisit again your risk assessment kasi baka hindi na um, sufficient yung risk controls mo for a given um, increase in your um, reactants and materials and identify all the hazards per step and assess the individual hazards, uh, assess their risks individually, implement additional risk controls as needed, um, refer to other RAs as needed, and revisit um, the RAs every three years. Um, so I, I just wanted to add for these additional risk controls, so I've mentioned that for um, risk levels three and up, you have to consider additional risk controls. So you can add additional risk controls. So for example, if you have to, um, to put in additional engineering controls. So for example, if you have to install a glove box and things like that, um, you have to identify who is the person responsible and by what date. And so once this is accomplished, so once the additional risk control is, 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 is in place, so for example, nakabili na kayo ng glove box, um, you have to uh, revise or modify again your risk assessment to include that additional risk control into your existing risk control. And doon mawawala na yung part na nandito. So that will be like how you make use of this part of the uh, risk assessment. Okay, so 
um eto so i think this one i'll just briefly go through working in the la- working in the lab in the new normal so i think we're all um yeah we're all mostly based home um we do not have much lab activities but i think um for some of us uh, who can work in the lab during mecq or gcq situations then uh, of course it is important to note some of these uh, guidelines um so you have to of course limit the number of people in the lab at any given time so you can do shift work or you can do um alternate weeks or multiple days so depending on the work that is done in your lab you can actually um arrange this um work arrangement so uh for example for us who do more of metabolomics experiments wherein we need to make use of the equipments for like two or three days then the alternate weeks or multiple day uh, arrangements works better for us so for those naman that that can be done within six to eight hours, you can actually uh, arrange for shift works um, and have project bodies. So actually, uh, during this pandemic, uh, especially if you cannot really be in the lab um, as long as your experiments, uh, so for example, nga, shift work, pero yung experiments mo is running for like um, extended hours. So then it will be good to have somebody from another shift time to, to work with you and to help you like, uh, to also work on that particular experiment. And so it's a good time to collaborate with your uh, uh, lab mates. Uh, designated work areas, of course, you can set, um, as you can see from here, uh, for example, one person will be working only in this area, the other will be here. Uh, in case of shared facilities, in cases wherein you have to share like uh, one area with another person, then you have to make sure that you have the proper distance, so still social distancing. Um, regular disinfection of shared work areas and contact surfaces. So this has to be done after every shift or kapag merong ibang gagamit ng mga equipment. So at the end of the day, so it's good that before you start and after you do your experiments, do your disinfection. Um, ensure compliance to guidelines, of course, depending on uh, whether ECQ, GCQ, MECQ, and of course, your, your university or your workplaces will also have their own guidelines. So please comply. Uh, be responsible. So alam ko, masisipag tayo lahat. We, we want to uh, work in the lab as much as possible. Pero if you're sick, please stay at home. Uh, or if you're a close contact, please do stay at home and protect yourself. Protect the, uh, protect the, the people that you're working with. And please get vaccinated. So it's important um, that we get vaccinated, protect um, um, ourselves, those in the lab, as well as our loved ones. So, yun. Um, for safety resources, you can look at ACS Center for Lab Sa- Safety. They have a lot of materials available in different aspects of lab safety. Um, the Chemical Safety Library provides more of um, content on hazardous reactions. Safety Net is providing materials for um, synthetic chemists, so more on the synthetic chemistry uh, side. So um, thank you uh, to everyone, to the Field Sci Hub team, especially to Jeff, JP, Mamdaang, to Dindi uh, for allowing me to be part of this um, this webinar, for allowing me to share um, on safety, uh, to the DLSU Central Inst- Instrumentation team, and to my boss. Uh, Professor Dexel Camacho for giving me, for allowing me to participate here to uh, for supporting this initiative. So passion ko talaga yung mag-share, um, not only about my research work but also about um, ensuring that we have that um, safety culture, that safety awareness when we're when we're working in the lab. And so thank you for supporting this initiative um, to Ms. Zochen and the Occupational Safety, Health and Environment um, team of NUS. Thank you for um, giving me giving me the permission to to share these materials uh, as well um, to my annual seniors who has um, uh, really inculcated in me the safety culture and awareness. Thank you uh, to my PI perform, former PI Prof Sam Lee and my lab mates for working with me for so many years and for being patient with me. Uh, of course, because if you're if you're in charge of safety, uh, minsan. Uh, and uh, uh, um, you can come in conflict or arguments, but it's good that um, I have very open-minded lab mates as well. And so um, we can discuss, we can 
uh, compromise um, and we can figure out how to do uh, things safely and properly. And my previous boss was also very supportive of that. And so um, I also encourage for the PIs who are watching, uh, please do uh, take care of your students. These are students and researchers that are put in your care. Uh, make sure that you also look out for their safety. Um, Yes, uh, the NUS Environmental Research Institute, Safety Committee and Management. Again, uh, these are people that I have learned a lot from and I have worked with for several years. And so thank you to everyone. And that's all. So if you have any questions, I'll, uh, please do email me and I'll try to answer them. Uh, and yeah, we'll have some time to answer questions now. So that's all. Salamat. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Lazarna a virtual clap and <laughs> so again uh we have a lot of questions here uh was a slide natin so i guess we can uh go one by one uh dr lacerna so the first okay. one is from fritz pizarro how okay. do you determine the expire date of prepared solutions Okay, actually, Fritz, um, yung expiry date of prepared solutions, uh, depende kasi siya dun stability of that particular solution. So there are solutions wherein uh, hindi siya advisable ng gamitin after it has been exposed to air. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Sige. Okay na. <laughs> Sorry. Ayun. So if it has been exposed to air or it has, um, it has been used for like a day, so meron mga ganun. So um, that is usually the expiry of the solution. So depending on the stability. Uh, so if it's um, stable only for a day, then yeah, just use for a day. If it's if it's not stable anymore after it has been exposed to air, then you have to consider that. So uh, that is with regards to expiry. Some solutions that are relatively safe and uh, is stable two time, then you can keep it longer, like for a month or so. Uh, but um, in some cases, as you know, for analytical chemistry laboratories, there are solutions that has to be prepare, prepared freshly. Uh, and so you have to take note of that as well. And I, that's, yeah, that's true. And also, I think uh, some uh, in, you know, industrial labs, they set it on their standard operating procedure. Yes. Claro, <laughs> mm, yes, um, yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And uh, from Ryan Wong, generally... Can we neutralize acid with any base or vice versa before disposal? Ayan. <laughs> okay. So I think, again, we have to go back to um, compatibilities. So uh, acid, siya, di ba? for example, if you're working with organic acid, you cannot neutralize it with organic bases. Uh, consequently, if you have organic uh, inorganic bases, you cannot neutralize them with uh, organic acids kasi pwede silang mag, mag, maging reactive, it can cause fire. Um, generally, if you are working with or inorganic acids, you neutralize them with inorganic bases. Uh, so yun. Uh, and of course, those that are not very reactive, uh, you have to consider that. So usually, I think you make use of sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, right, uh, to neutralize acids para water, uh, you only generate carbon dioxide um, as, a, as a product. Uh, so yun, you have to consider those. Yeah. Um, from Jonah Alim, our school science lab is just small. Are there available spill kits in the market? Can you recommend a reference for the content of the spill kit and first aid kit for the science laboratory? Okay. So actually, um, in terms of chemical safety, the basic contents of a lab spill kit will be uh, your glove, your your if if you have um, usually naman may goggles ka naman in place na so you don't need the goggles in your spill kits but uh, you would need your gloves like forceps or things that you have to that you can use to take hold of the contaminated material. Uh, your absorbent pads like they have like um, absorbent pillows or even like um, absorbent sheets sheets that that is used to contain the the to contain and to absorb the spills. So, and like um, chemical waste bags uh, to contain the, the waste after the cleanup. So those are the basic um, contents of a spill kit. Uh, usually naman, 
available naman no so sorry ah, bago pa ako dito sa mga labs dito um so available naman to sa mga chemistry lab suppliers uh yep tsaka baka And, meron sa ano Shopee <laughs> ayun actually <laughs> na-reach ko lang ah Andaing chemicals na available sa Shopee. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I have I I can I will be happy with that. Yeah. I'm happy because it's accessible pero I'm a bit worried in terms of like regulation and like control. <laughs> Ay totoo so, yan. Yeah. <laughs> totoo nga yan. <laughs> so, so yun. Um and yeah, yeah, you can check Shopee or ano. First aid kit naman um I think it's more of like to address cuts um and yun nga in case na meron kayong mga mga special experiments involving highly dangerous substances like hydro, um hydrofluoric acid then you have have the kit or the cream for that uh, pero usually it's more of like um your usual first aid kits like uh, gauzes um It's more to address cuts. So more of bandages, uh yon, yung mga yon, mga common uh, first aid kits content kits content lang. Uh mm-hmm. unless as needed. Mm-mm. All right. So moving on to the next question from Emmanuel Kapingpin. How should expired chemicals used in in general chem 1 and 2? So sa ka- college chemistry to, no? So I do not know of any licensed third-party waste collectors in Pangasinan. Any suggestions, Bo? Ah, okay. Again, I'm sorry. I am still not very <laughs> familiar with the suppliers here. But there should be um, third-party waste collectors that you should be able to contract. So sa Pangasinan, so medyo malapit pa naman siya. So it can be traveled by land uh, from Manila. So you can actually perhaps look for... so. Um, collectors in Manila or in other uh, provinces na medyo mas malapit and then try to contact them. Uh, uh, yes, y- you have to consider disposing expired chemicals. Um, uh, in our previous lab, uh, because um, my boss has been in NUS for quite a while, uh, I think at some point we had over 2,500 chemicals in the lab, which we do not really know of what to use for and they're uh-huh. all expired. So, um, first, it becomes dangerous through time kasi it can be it can become unstable and second is um it takes up space in your chemical cabinets so uh, as you as you perform your experiments you will need that uh, space in your chemical cabinets and so you have to make sure that you clear out these expired chemicals yeah and i think it's something that they should uh, coordinate with their department heads Diba? Yes, yes. <laughs> so actually, oo. Oh, oh. Kasi mm-hmm. minsan, um, it will be cheaper if it's mm-hmm. a bulk disposal. So mm-hmm. it will be good to um, coordinate with your department if they can uh, arrange for a bulk disposal of the waste across different labs in your uh, department. That will be better actually. So mm-hmm. less effort on the waste collector and it's also mm-hmm. should cost less on your part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ayan. Okay, so we have uh, another question from Princess Quin- Sara Quintana. Dr. Car- Karen, your delivery is very comprehensive and clear. My question is about waste disposal. How can we contact oh, so ito na naman, ano? oh, how, how can we contact those third-party waste collectors since we are in the province? Is there a separate training for treating those waste? Okay, so again, yes, um, Depende dun sa location, you can try to find um, third-party collectors na medyo mas malapit, uh, depende sa province, or if you can contact someone in Manila. I understand that uh, perhaps not in all locations or provinces meron talagang third-party collectors. So you you might have to arrange for someone coming from a different area to, uh, to work on that. And also, in terms of treating wastes, um, I do not really advise like treating the waste itself unless you're very familiar with what is present in that waste. Um, and for example, uh, basic acid-based uh, waste. So um, you can do re- uh, neutralization before um, um, disposal for small amounts, of course. Uh, but if you're working with like um, organic wastes and you're not very familiar with the incompatibilities, uh, it's better to like 
just dispose them as is. As long as, as, as the container is properly secured, you have enough headspace in your carboy, and they are in the proper container. So, yun. I see si Ma'am Da ang nagre-raise ng hands. Okay, uh, thank you, Karen. Actually, um, just a little bit of information about data. Uh, medyo mahirap nga kasi maghanap ng third party mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. waste collector. Even in UPLB, I think um, we're having some problems. Ang yes, isang, yes. Definitely, uh, mas okay sa kanila yung bulk. Kaya lang, i-consider mo din by volume ata yung pag-aana nila, pagpa-pricing nila. Mm, oo. Oo. Oh, tapos so tapos meron din kasing coding codes na nilalagay so please check yung DEN, DENR memo i just forgot anong number pero may oh, mga code yon dapat properly segregated di ba sabi naman ni Karen kanina properly segregated ba yung mercury definitely hindi mo siya pwedeng isama sa iba kahit na puro metals yung ba puro transition metals separate pa rin talaga yung mercury So it should be properly labeled yung mga para mas madali yung masasabi doon sa third party uh, contractor kung ano yung i-collect nila. Tatanungin din kasi nila yun eh. Hmm. Actually ano, uh, usually you will you will have to provide a list of the what are the different chemicals, what are the different categories as well as the volume. So yun, kailangan yung itik note yun. You have to provide that to the third party waste collector. And also yun, as as doc um as Ma'am Daang has mentioned, um there are certain chemicals that you cannot combine with anything else. So that will include your yun nga, met, uh, mercury, HF, so yung mga ganung chemicals, you have to uh, store them uh, as one container, as one carboy. Hindi mo siya pwedeng isa ihalo sa iba. Okay. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anna Karen Lacerna. Um, unfortunately, no, we're running out of time. Meron po tayong uh, kasunod na event after this. So uh, we copied all the all the questions that you have. And uh, we're, uh, Dr. Anna will try to respond to them uh, via sa email. Sa email. Ayan. So um, maraming maraming salamat po for participating. And thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lasorna, uh, JP, do you have uh, any announcements? Ayan, so nahulog yung headset ko, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, well, in behalf of uh, Filipino Science Hub and all of the uh, participants here on Zoom and on YouTube, we would like to uh, present this certificate of appreciation. So talagang uh, na-appreciate namin yung time ni Karen to uh, put up this webinar kasi sobrang comprehensive nga niya. Ang dami nagsasabi sa mga Uh, participants natin na parang this is uh, easily a one day training po sa mga uh, sa mga companies sa mga schools so parang uh, ito talagang uh, ni lahat na ni Karen yung lahat ng ni, ni Dr. Karen yung um, mga safety aspects ayan we would like to uh, present this certificate of, of appreciation to Dr. Anna Karen Lacerna of the academic academic service an academic service and a faculty and equipment specialist at uh, CIF De La Salle University for delivering this web- webinar Safety and Risk Management in the Lab organized by the Filipino Science Hub and held by Zoom and YouTube live on this 14th day of August 2021 signed Dr. Jeffrey Bunkin and uh, yours truly, uh, JP Onya. Ayan, maraming maraming salamat, Karen. Ayan. Okay. Thank you rin. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyo, Phil Sci Hub, JP, Jeff, Dindi, Ma'am Daang, Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share. Yon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, And for, for all the participants, thank you. Yan. Ako, Karen, maraming maraming salamat. Napakagaling po ni Karen. By the way po, si Karen po ay uh, para kong kapatid yan sa, ano, sa UPLB. Magka-team kami yan sa, ano, sa Paxic Laban. So, anyways, Karen, maraming maraming salamat. And um, I would like to welcome you to Filipino Science Hub. So, <laughs> <laughs> ayun po. Oh, muli po, maraming maraming salamat po ulit sa pagsama ninyo sa amin linggo um, um, Watch out for upcoming announcements po. Essentially, yung kalendaryo ninyo hanggang January, uh, mapupuno na po namin. And one more thing. So, we would like to thank you Central um, Instrumentation Facility of, De- of De La Salle University. One very important announcement po. We're coming up with an Karen, is it an eight or seven-part webinar series on all 
the different uh, areas of analytical chemistry. So, buwan-buwan po iyan. Um, yun pong mga eksperto natin from De La Salle University will deliver webinars every month on specific topics and um, their applications in research. So, yun po. Uh, antabayanan niyo po yan kasi that's up and coming. And I think our first uh, our first event is on is, is in September, right, Karen? September, oh. So, September we'll have... September po. Yes, we'll have somebody from um, Chris Argamino, Mr. Chris Argamino from the Atomic and Molecular Spectroscopy Lab of CIF to talk on his applications of um, spectroscopy and environmental research. So please do look forward to that. Yep, so this is a collaboration between PhilSci Hub and the Center for Instrumentation of CIF of CL CLSU. So open po yan sa lahat ng teachers, researchers, at saka po mga, mga estudyante na gusto mag-participate. Um, that event is for free. Ito po ay uh, may servisyo po para sa inyo. And that is also to promote yung uh, familiarity po, familiarity, Biernes na. Famil familiarity po ninyo. <laughs> familiarity po ninyo sa lahat ng mga um, analytical facilities within the country. And CIF of the LSU is actually um, a center to the, the, that you should actually also go to. Alright. Karen, maraming maraming salamat. Uh, meron po kami yung kasunod na event. Um, yun po mga questions we'll en entertain later. Karen, would you like to join us for Lions then? For the opening okay, of Lions sure. then? Uh, right after this one. Okay. Maraming maraming salamat po ulit sa inyo. Ati Dindi, would you like to formally close up the event? Okay. So, again, salamat po at uh, kita-kits po ulit sa susunod na webinar. So, have a good uh, weekend po and uh, mag-ingat po tayong lahat. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Uh, by the way, yung pong uh, uh, Google Form link ay nakapost na sa chat box saka sa uh, dito po sa Zoom and sa YouTube. And after the webinar, you can check the um, the video description po nung uh, live live stream video sa YouTube. So I think alat taman po ay may link don sa ano na yon. So sa mga magahanap po sa mga ma malulus yung kanilang link. So pakibalikan na lang po yung video. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks everyone. Karen, see you on the other side. Bye. -bye. Thank yep. you. Hey, Thanks everyone. <laughs> I, I will send you the link. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Sige.